This is where the carbon dioxide is removed, in these tall towers. The principle is quite simple. The gases pass through a concentrated solution of potassium carbonate. The carbon dioxide reacts with the water and the K2CO3 to produce the compound potassium hydrogen carbonate, KHCO3, and the other gases pass on. In another vessel, the potassium hydrogen carbonate solution is heated. This causes decomposition and the carbon dioxide is released again and can be used elsewhere in the plant or sold. While the potassium carbonate solution left can be used again to mop up more carbon dioxide. We've now removed from the gas stream all the carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and there's just nitrogen and hydrogen and very small quantities of noble gases left. These pass into the reactor where they're turned into ammonia gas. It's the vessel in the middle in which the synthesis takes place. The amounts of gases used have been so arranged that there is now one mole of nitrogen to every three of hydrogen. On heating, these react to give two moles of ammonia, NH3. But ammonia decomposes, turning back into nitrogen and hydrogen if it gets too hot. In practice, a catalyst is used which speeds up the reaction and the process is designed so that the temperature doesn't rise too high. This is the catalyst that's used. It contains iron together with substances which act as promoters so that it has a catalytic action. Big compressors are used to compress the nitrogen and hydrogen to a pressure of about 220 atmospheres before the gases pass into the converter. The reason why the gases are compressed is this. It takes one molecule of nitrogen and three molecules of hydrogen to produce two molecules of ammonia. If at a given temperature we compress the nitrogen-hydrogen mixture, the molecules are squeezed up into a smaller volume. In order to relieve the pressure, ammonia is formed, the two molecules of NH3 taking up less room than the original four molecules. The ammonia produced is condensed out by cooling to give liquid ammonia. Some of this is supplied to other parts of the complex, some is sold, and some is dissolved in water and sold as aqueous solution. There's a complex system of pipework and pumps. The whole plant is controlled from a central control room where the operators can monitor everything that's happening. Plants like this use up enormous quantities of the raw materials and vast amounts of energy. We asked Colin Linus in charge of the plant about this. The main raw material we use uh, for the process is natural gas. If you were to take an ordinary household gas bill, uh, this one of these plants which makes 40 tonnes an hour of ammonia, uh, uses enough gas to keep a quarter of a million of those houses going. The other main raw material that we use is the air that we breathe. Uh, we use this in vast quantities. If uh, you take the amount of air that we use in one hour and blow up some party balloons, you'll end up with a, about a million party balloons every hour of that sort of size. Much of the complicated layout in any chemical plant is to do with conserving energy, with wasting as little heat or electricity as possible. Energy conservation is one of our major problems. If we could save 0.1% of our fuel over a year, the amount of money that would save us is in tens of thousands of pounds. As an operating manager on this ammonia plant, the most important thing that I do on a daily basis is to keep the plant efficient that is to minimise the amount of energy that we use to make a tonne of ammonia. And that is by far the most important job that, that is needed to be done these days. And that goes for any industrial process. What's ammonia used for? Well, it can be turned into many valuable products. We look at just two. 
a laboratory demonstration. This is concentrated aqueous ammonia solution. If we heat up a spiral of platinum wire fastened to a glass rod and suspend it over the solution, it continues to glow. If we bubble oxygen through the solution, the effect is even more marked. This is what's happening. In the presence of a catalyst, platinum, oxygen oxidizes ammonia, removing hydrogen and adding oxygen. We get oxides of nitrogen and water vapor produced. The reaction is exothermic. It gives out heat, which is why the wire continued to glow red hot. If the gases produced are passed into cold water, the oxides of nitrogen react to produce, in the end, nitric acid, HNO3, a very useful chemical. This is what happens on the laboratory scale. On the industrial scale, it's much bigger and more impressive. The oxidation of ammonia in a very up-to-date plant at Billingham. You can see the shimmering flame as the ammonia is oxidized. The catalyst is a great sheet made of platinum rhodium alloy gauze, very expensive, although it lasts a long time, acting only as a catalyst. Here's a small piece. It's gradually poisoned by impurities when it's removed, replaced and melted down to make new gauze. This particular plant uses liquid ammonia from the harbour process. This is evaporated to turn it into gas, then piped up to the ammonia burner. Ammonia and air can produce an explosive mixture under certain conditions. Special valves control the supply of ammonia and air. They would close down the plant immediately if the temperature started to rise too high. As always, as little energy as possible is wasted. All pipes are lagged, and the heat and pressure produced are used to heat up incoming gases, raise steam, and drive compressors. Steam produced is used to drive a high-pressure turbine and generate electricity. In fact, as well as producing nitric acid, the plant also acts as a power station, producing electrical energy that can be used elsewhere in the complex, as well as in this plant. In the big absorption tower, nitric acid is produced from the oxides of nitrogen, excess air and water. The design is such that almost no oxides of nitrogen escape into the atmosphere to produce acids with water vapour in the air. This avoids pollution, which is such an important concern in the world today. Modern nitric acid plants are far cleaner than the older ones. Taking off a sample of concentrated acid for testing from the tower. Nitric acid is highly corrosive, so he must wear goggles and protective clothing. The acid is slightly coloured by dissolved oxides of nitrogen. It can be further purified if necessary. All this complex system of lagged pipework is not simply to manufacture nitric acid, it's to make it as economically as possible without wasting more energy than can possibly be avoided. As we've seen, the plant produces steam and electricity as well as the main chemical product. It's a splendid example of the work of chemical engineers, very different from the sort of apparatus you use in the school lab. The nitric acid produced is stored in huge stainless steel tanks. Some of it is sold. Most is converted here into useful products. We'll look at one. Nitric acid can be neutralized by ammonia, a base, to produce the salt, ammonium nitrate, in solution. Now, ammonium nitrate is a very reactive substance. The nitrate part is a strong oxidizing agent. It can, for instance, under certain conditions, oxidize the ammonium part, producing heat and a large volume of gas, resulting in an explosion. 
Here at the ICI Nitrum plant at Billingham, nitric acid neutralizes aqueous ammonia from the harbor plant to produce ammonium nitrate. Heat is produced when an acid neutralizes a base, so the reaction is carefully controlled. Ammonium nitrate solution is produced. Magnesium nitrate is also added and the mixture concentrated. The resulting liquid is sprayed down a high tower called a prilling tower. As it falls, any remaining water evaporates off from the rain of hot droplets and solid pellets called prill collect at the bottom. It looks like a liquid, but these are actually solid pellets fluidized by having compressed air blown in from below so that they flow like a liquid. Here's a sample of the nitram prill. They're used always to heat up the air blown in to prevent the prill from picking up moisture and clogging. But was this necessary? Could energy be saved by only heating the air when, say, there was a high humidity? A technologist working on the plant got the idea that this might be a possibility. Here she is, Jeanette Smith, to tell us about it. One of the jobs we've been working on at the moment is to try and reduce the amount of steam we use on heating the air to the fluid beds. Uh, one of the reasons we heat the air is to try and stop moisture being picked up from the atmosphere. And by increasing the air temperature, it uh, stops the water going into the prill. We believe that the temperature that the air is being heated to is too high and that we could have the same effect by having a much lower air temperature to the fluid bed. So we did some tests around this system to see what the lowest air temperature we could have for a given humidity. When we'd uh, done the test, we discovered that we could more or less, in the dead of winter, turn off the steam. I got to do some further work around alternative humidities, and with any luck, we should be able to reduce the steam usage on the system quite dramatically. And that will enable the nitram fertilizer to be made more economically. It's bagged automatically, ready for sale. The ammonium nitrate it contains provides nitrogen for growing plants. The magnesium nitrate is there to keep it from clogging because of atmospheric moisture. They make other fertilizers too, the nitrogenous part always coming from harbor process ammonia, which itself comes from the nitrogen in the atmosphere. Synthetic fertilizers play a vital part in world food production, and their manufacture involves chemistry on a very big scale. It requires the knowledge, imagination and skill of chemists and engineers. What do you have to do to become a skilled technologist in a big undertaking such as this ICI Agricultural Division in Billingham? We asked Jeanette Smith. Well, normally you'd need a, a degree uh, in chemical engineering or uh, in mechanical engineering. Um, I did my degree at Edinburgh and to get into the degree course you'd normally need A-levels or in the Scottish system, alternative higher qualifications in maths, physics and chemistry. I decided to do engineering in my fifth form at school. Um, when I looked at, I enjoyed science and especially maths, and I wanted something which was sort of chemistry orientated. What does she get out of her job? What's the most important thing about it? Apart, of course, from her own career. Apart from career? Uh, energy saving, really. Um, anything that can save the company money. Um, anything which can improve technology because technology is always advancing and you build your plant 1960 and by 1970 it's out of date so if you can reuse that technology to improve your process to improve your product then it's worth doing um, so my part of my responsibility is to look around at alternative process and alternative ways of um, approaching a problem people allow you to develop your own ideas and I mean if they're stupid then they'll tell you and that's a fair comment and if they're good then they'll let you carry on and they'll let you develop them and I think that's a well for me it's a very important part of being an engineer. Does she enjoy it? Yes very much so yeah.